Okay, so this is the second part in our discussion of the Laplace uh, transfer functions. This is actual transfer function analysis. In the last pick last video, we developed our transfer function for this DC motor, starting with basic equations, putting it in Laplace transform form, and here is our transfer function, um, assuming that our initial conditions are equal to zero. Just to, uh, we could do the same analysis on the homogeneous response using the initial conditions, but we'll stick to uh, our analysis of the response to the system in as a function of some input. So what are the things we can look at? Well, for one thing, we can look at uh, what is the final value. Where does this thing go? Where does it settle out? Um, our final value theorem tells us that the limit as t approaches infinity of, that's not infinity, that's an 8. As t approaches infinity of um, y of t um, is equal to the limit as s approaches 0 of y or s, y of s or an s times y of s. So what I will do, and since um, in this case we'll apply it, we'll assume that we have a step input, so my uh, same, say 12, 12 volt step, so that's 12 over s, and I'll multiply this by s, And then I want the limit, so I want um, limit as s approaches zero of that, and that will give me my um, y of t at t affinity, or a y steady state. So, for the first thing, because I have a step function, this and this cancel out. Um, as s approaches zero, this term, this term go to zero, and we're left with y steady state equals k t q um, over l times j all over k b plus k t q all over l j and most of these cancel out oh, times 12 here's that 12 so the, that cancels that cancels uh, KTQ cancels, and so essentially what I'm left with is basically um, the magnitude of my step over KB. So for our DC motor, the final speed, the final mega, final output, is a function of the voltage and this back EMF constant. And, and that makes sense because Essentially, at the final speed, you're not accelerating the, you know, net torque is zero. I've got I've gotten a load torque applied in here, um, so that's just saying that basically the back EMF is going to match this VS, and that's where we'll stabilize out, or be a function of that back EMF. So that's our steady state result. Now. We can do some more analysis of the system um, using that same equation. I can rewrite it just a little bit into transfer function form where I have the ratio um, y of s over u of s, uh, or I guess I was using v. Sorry. which is essentially the response of the output as a function of the input, but we don't have the input on this side of the equation because we're interested in the properties of the system itself. Now, we're not interested in the properties of the signal. We just want to know, how is this system going to behave as a dynamic system? Is it stable? Is it, does it oscillate? Things like that. Um, so what we want to do is find, look at the poles and zeros. Zeros, um, and I'm going to write this here as n of s over 
d of s, so we have a numerator and a denominator, uh, pull zeros equal the roots of n of s, roots of the numerator. Those are the values of s that cause this numerator to go to zero and cause the whole uh, transfer function to go to zero. And in this case, there are none. Zero of poles are the roots of the denominator, d of s. So those values that cause the denominator to go to zero, those values of s, when the denominator goes to zero, obviously this transfer function goes to infinity, hence the name poles. And we see there are, uh, there are going to be poles. It's a second order equation here, so I know that there's going to be two poles. Uh, how do we find them? Well, because it's second order, we can apply the quadratic equation. You remember if we have a, a polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c, then the, the roots of that b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, right? Okay. Remember that? I hope you remember that. So I can apply that and I get, um, in this case, a is equal to 1, b is equal to r over l, c is equal to that. So I get, I get, um, Is this. So when I find the roots of the denominator, I find that it's, are my poles, come from r over 2l, that's uh, minus e, plus or minus square root of b squared r over l squared minus or A is 1, C is K, E, K, P, Q over L times J. Okay? So that gives me my poles. There will be two of them. Minus R over 2. Yep, that's right. And there are no zeros, as I said. So to actually we come up with values, I need to apply numbers. If I take the numbers that we used before when I had this model, um, and again, those are not, these are not realistic numbers for a, a motor. Um, I think I could, in particular, this is way too big for what we got going, and then so I had to make that too big and stuff. But for illustrating the processes, we're okay. So if I put plug those numbers into there, I come up with, with um, with the poles here at um, minus 499 and minus 0 0.45, okay? Um, that's finding it manually. There's a couple ways we can do it automatically, and, and particularly if, you know, if we don't have the second order quadratic thing, we can't use a quadratic formula. Um, we can let MATLAB do the heavy lifting, for example. Um, if I put these numbers in, I get, um, I guess, to be consistent, I've, I've been calling this actually omega, right? Uppercase omega of s. Um, I can say that this is equal to 15,000 over s squared plus. 500 S I should have come up with numbers that didn't <laughs> give me a lot of fives because fives and S look too much alike in my handwriting. Plus 255. Okay. Um, I can, you know, crunch that out. I can put this into MATLAB, let MATLAB do the heavy lifting. Uh, if I, a quick review, if I want to specify a polynomial in MATLAB, I have ax squared plus bx plus c, and I want to send that to some function. What I really send is the coefficients um, in, a, in a vector, a, b, and c. 
Let's see, upper and lower case. Okay. Um, if I had a x squared plus or a x, let's make this a x cubed plus b x squared plus c. Okay. Um, in this case, I would make my vector a b, and there is no x term here, so I put a zero c. Okay. So that that same thing we, we did in our poly fit, poly valve examples on the curve fitting. We do the same thing when we put these polynomials, powers of S, into a uh, transfer function and things like that. So what I will do, MATLAB command, if I just want to find the roots of this denominator or the characteristic equation, I can say the roots. Of, I give it a vector 1, 500, 255, and it gives me the same roots that I got before, that 499, minus 499, and minus 0.45. Okay? Um, another thing I could do is I can create a linear time invariant. Uh, dynamic system in MATLAB, and I'm likely to want to do that because, you know, if I'm doing this kind of analysis, I probably want to have a, a system model that I can do other things with. So I would use a command. Uh, in this case, since it's a transfer function form, I would use a transfer function command. There's other similar commands if I've done this in state space or if I've done it in terms of poles and zeros. But I can say that um, I'll give a name sys equals tf, and the first argument in the tf, these are all lowercase tf in, in MATLAB. Uh, the, the, first, the first argument is the uh, polynomial that represents the numerator, and here um, the numerator is 15,000, or I could put in the variables, I could say it's k q divided by L times J. So that's my, and actually since it's a scalar, I don't need these brackets around it. So that's my numerator sent to this command. And then my denominator is basically the same thing here. I'll say 1. Uh, the next value is R divided by L, and then the third one is K B times K T Q divided by L times J. Close the square brackets, close that, and that will create a linear time invariant system inside MATLAB. Uh, using the values that I've previously defined for all these terms. And it's probably a better way than doing it numerically because this avoids, you know, if I've done some round off or things like that, it works generally better. Now, so I have this system created. I can do a lot of things with it. I can type step this and get the step re response to the unit step. I can Put it into a, a, I can put it into a Simulink, uh, you know, in, in just defining it as sys. There's a lot of things I can do. But to find the poles, I can just say pole sys, and it'll echo that back. Uh, it'll echo back the values of the poles that I previously found. Okay. Okay, so here I've, I've plotted up um, our imaginary or complex S-plane with the axis here. We have the real axis and an imaginary axis. So when I plot a uh, complex number, I can plot the real part and the imaginary part. I'll be plotting the location of the poles as I change the resistance in this equation. So I'm going to change this resistor here uh, because it essentially changes this term, which affects the damping a lot without changing the others. And again, this is not realistic, but it's something we can do just to see how the 
poles, the location of these poles affects stability in the system response. So my initial value, I said the resistor was equal to 5, and I get poles at minus 499 point something or another, and a minus 0.45. So minus 0.45 is somewhere here, and 499 is off, off the chart. Um, if I reduce the resistance to 0.5 ohms, I get poles at minus 45 and minus 5, so I got poles here and here, okay? If I reduce, oh, before I show you, um, this is the time response in MATLAB of the system output as a function of time. This is seconds, and this is the output. Uh, we got about 800 uh, RPM, like we predicted or radians per second actually on RPM. Um, and then, you know, it took about 15 seconds. Now when I reduce the resistance to 0.5, I get two, two curves. I get the original curve here, and because I move those poles, you can see how much faster this response is here. So as that pole moves away from the real axis, I get, I get a much faster speed from there to there. So the next point here, I've got a point 0.3 resistance, that's minus 15 and minus 15, so at that point my poles converge right here on the real axis, and if I look at this picture, um, you can see it's kind of lighter gray, it's, it's fairly fast and it just hits that um, 800 RPM or radians per second, uh, like the other ones, but that's the fastest of them, but it's still a a damp, stable response, okay? Now, I can, that was at point 0.3, if I reduce the resistance to 0.25, now I start to get complex roots, okay? In my um, quadratic equation, minus b plus minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2 a, and I'm not being consistent here, am I? Okay, um, at that point, the 4ac is getting bigger than the b squared, so as I make this resistance smaller and smaller, my b squared is getting smaller and smaller, 4ac is staying the same, so at some point, I start to get a negative number in the square root, so I get a complex uh, result. So, um, at this point I've got, my roots are minus 12.5 plus or minus 8.3i, so 12.5 um, plus or minus 8.3i is about here and here on that complex plane. And so now I've got complex numbers, and if I look at my um, time response, this is the the one curve here to the left is the curve with, with the resistance of 0.3, which is our critically damped resistance. And then this one here, you can see it actually overshoots and comes back down a little bit. But it is a little faster. Um, it just takes a little longer to die out. Okay? So, so the next point here, uh, 0.2, I'm at 10 plus or minus 11.2. So I'm about there, and there is not very well drawn, but that's about a 45 degree angle here, supposed to be. <laughs> um, and, and this gives me, or a point two, yeah. So that gives me this, this line here with this overshoot that takes some time to go away, okay? Now, if I move all the way, resistance all the way down to point 0.1, I get minus 5 plus or minus 14. So now I'm at minus 5 plus or minus 14. So I'm here and here. Okay. Now these roots are getting closer to that real axis again, right? The, the real part of the root is getting smaller, even though the imaginary is getting larger. And because I have that root there, now I'm getting this oscillation, and that oscillation takes time for it to die out. It's taking longer to die out than some of these curves were reaching the static value. 
And the reason for that is, of course, that these poles, well, they're getting, the angle is increasing, so they get more oscillation, and they're getting closer to the real axis, so it does take it longer to die out as I get closer and closer. Um, if I make resistance, resistance point zero 0.01, I get poles at a negative 0.5 and plus or minus 15, approximately. So I'm starting to get real close to the real axis, okay? And what I see here is quite simply, um, I get an oscillation that it's big and it takes a long, long time to die out. If you look closely, you can see in here the original uh, response that died out fairly quickly. Now, but now that I'm close to that real axis again, this takes a long, long time to die out. And the final result, if I made my resistance zero, obviously, I would get strictly imaginary poles right on the imaginary axis. And here, instead of a stable system where it may oscillate, but those oscillations do die out of time, I get a marginally stable system where it, it just oscillates forever at a constant magnitude like this. And you can see that, okay? So by knowing where the location of these poles are, I can tell you is the system stable? Oh, and I didn't plot it, but any any poles, there are any poles on the right hand half of this plane, any positive real part, it goes unstable. Okay? So in any all the when all the poles are negative real, it's stable. When the poles start to um, diverge and become complex. And through here, about to that 45, I get an overshoot. And beyond that 45, I get oscillations. Oh, let's see. Okay. So by understanding that angle, understanding you know, the magnitude of the real part versus the magnitude of the imaginary part, um, and, and this, this is this is no this is critically damped right here. And, and when we go out here, it's over damp. So by understanding, you know, this, the location of those poles, I can tell you is the system going to be reasonably fast? Is it going to be slow? Is it going to oscillate? Is it going to overshoot? And you hopefully saw that as we as we reduce that resistance, we are we had a trajectory for these poles. So that came in like this and somewhere from out there, this pole came in till they converged here, and then they split and went this way and around essentially a circle here, which I've tried to draw, uh, as we keep reducing that resistance. So that's kind of a locus plot, and you can predict how these are going to move um, as you change certain parameters, okay? And I think that's all I need to say about the Laplace transfer function for the moment. It can, uh, we didn't really touch on poles. Poles get messy. Um, essentially, when I add poles, it, 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 it moves, this, moves things for you and, and changes the way the whole system works once you sort it out. Um, but the main thing for stability, I add poles, zeros. I said poles, I meant zeros. The main thing for stability is the roots of the denominator, which are the poles, the values that make this transfer function go infinite. You map those out, and that tells you a lot about how your system's going to behave.